I live in Somerville, and you can find me usually working either out of Work Bar in Union Square in Somerville or Work Bar in Cambridge. Uh, I've been a lifelong art collector. The summer when I was 10 years old, I spent the entire summer doing odd jobs for neighbors to try to get enough cash to buy some art from a local artist whose work I really loved and exhibited every fall on a street art festival. Uh, and I still have that piece uh, hanging in my bedroom today. It's, it's a very cool piece. Um, so from that kind of comes my love for artists and love for making and, and helping artists, making art and helping artists. Uh, and before I started my own firm, Modern Renaissance Legal, I worked for a large firm in downtown Boston. And working there, I, I worked for a lot of large corporations and did the thing that a lot of lawyers do where I make people with money more money. I also worked with some nonprofits. And the work that I did for the nonprofit was, uh, it was pretty simple work, but it was very meaningful for them. And the, the work that I could do for that nonprofit, you know, it, it helped solidify a major part of their business plan for 10 years to come. And seeing how much of a difference that made for this company it helped push me in the direction to stop representing large companies and focus on small businesses, entrepreneurs, individuals, and artists. So the two topics that I'd like to cover today are copyright law, uh, kind of a broad introduction to copyright, and then also gallery law in Massachusetts and New England generally. Uh, copyright kind of as it's fundamental, it protects an original expression of an idea. Uh, so the two important parts there are that it has to be an original, uh, it, it, that your work has to be original. So you're not uh, copying uh, somebody else's work verbatim, you're not drawing on, uh, if there's some folk tune, uh, you're not using that folk tune and claiming that as your own. So that work has to be original and that it express, uh, protects an expression of an idea and not the idea itself. Um, so a good example of that is, let's say I've got a great idea for a horror film. Uh, the copyright law express, uh, protects the script that I write and not the idea for the film itself. Uh, a lot of the times you'll see copyright cases where somebody says, oh, they stole my idea for X, Y, and Z. That's not enough in copyright law. You have to actually have that, uh, an expression of that idea in some sort of fixed medium. Uh, and a fixed medium in this case can be an oil canvas, it can be a saved file on your computer. Um, <clears throat> as of 1978, which was the last major revision to copyright law as a whole, you get a copyright just by making a work. Uh, you don't have to register it. I'll talk about the benefits that you get from registering it uh, a little later. But just by fixing a work in some medium, either chiseling out of stone or, like I said, saving a poem on your computer or uh, putting a final stroke on a painting, you do have a copyright in that work and with that comes certain benefits. Uh, notably, uh, uh, one of the major benefits is uh, the ability to stop other people from using that work, uh, at least through something called the D Digital Millennium Copyright Act. So a way this will come up a lot is uh, you have a website and you post some work on your website and you see that somebody's copied your photograph or your painting and they're putting it on their website too. Uh, you can use the Digital Millennium Copyright Act even without a registered copyright to say, listen, uh, web post or whomever's posted that, I own that work. Under this law, you have to take it down. Or you have to say you're entitled to use it for some reason, either that you believe you have a license or, or otherwise. And again, please interrupt me with questions at any time. I'm happy to, happy to field them. So I, I mentioned about registering the copyright. There are a few paths to do that. The easiest way is to go on, and this is actually on the back of your uh, the sheet that says Modern Renaissance Legal. If you flip that over, um, some information about this. Uh, the Copyright Office rolled out something a few years ago called the Electronic Copyright Office, which allows you to register your work online. Uh, it comes with a few benefits. It's easier than doing the paper forms. It's less expensive than doing the paper forms. Uh, and you will get a registered copyright faster. Uh, the, it reduces the time it takes them to process it by somewhere around six to 10 months. Uh, for a individual artist, who's doing just registering just a single work, the fee is $35. If you're registering a compilation of work, which is, uh, let's say, a whole portfolio of photographs or several paintings or uh, an album, it's $55 as opposed to $85 for the uh, paper forms. Uh, the other benefit that comes with registering a work, uh, there are a few. Uh, the first off is, let's say that you get into a copyright dispute. In order to sue for copyright infringement, you either need a registered copyright, 
or you need uh, in some, and this, this law varies from state to state, um, or you need a, a copyright registration that's pending. Um, so you at least need to have that process going. By having that registration earlier, you entitle yourself to what's called statutory damages from an earlier date. Uh, statutory damages is basically something that says uh, if you infringe a copyright, the artist, the person who created it, is entitled to a minimum sum of money regardless. Uh, and that starts at $300 and goes up to uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of $150,000 per infringement. Uh, so that can mean, uh, it, it means a lot for the artist. It can mean uh, a huge, a potentially huge award. It can also mean that the artist uh, can get representation from uh, an attorney who would take the case on contingency because they're uh, more willing to take a case if there's a guaranteed award. If you don't have that uh, early registration, uh, any infringement that happens, come on in if you're here for the copyright talk. Nope. Any, uh, any infringement that happens before uh, you have a registered copyright, you have to prove what are called actual damage. So it's damages from uh, lost revenue from licensing, for instance. Uh, I have a question. Absolutely, uh, please. I've always heard, I'm an illustrator, and I've always heard that there's a limitation that the copyright um, application needs to be, in order to sue for statutory damages, that it needs to be, the copyright application needs to be done within 30 days of publication. Is uh, that true? It is, so uh, yes and no. Uh, you can get statutory damages from whenever the registration happens. Uh, if you want it to go back from the date that the work was first published, then you need to file it within 30 days, 30 days of registration. And then you get statutory damages going back to when it was first published, regardless of whether or not, uh, regardless of when the registration actually issues. And what if the infringement happened prior to your application for uh, uh, in the case, as long as you're filing it within 30 days, you still get, you're still entitled to statutory damages. If not, you're entitled to statutory damages once the registration issues. Okay. So look, if you're, if mm -hmm. you're in Massachusetts and the infringement is somewhere else, you're on the net. Mm -hmm. so you're, does Massachusetts law apply since it was registered in Massachusetts? It's federal law, so the federal law applies. Uh, the registration goes through the Library of Congress and the U.S. Copyright Office. So uh, regardless of where they are, it's the same copyright law that applies. The variance in whether or not you need the registration to actually sue is by, it's divided by region of the United States. Uh, it's an uh, artifact of the appellate courts for uh, federal law and how they're structured. Um, it's, it rarely comes up as a, as a major issue, but so that does vary a little bit. There are some minor regional variances in how the law is applied based on uh, what court system you're in, but it, by and large, the law is uniform across the United States. Any other questions? I will plow right on them. Um, I'm going to talk. Oh, yeah, please. Um, so, if I'm understanding you correctly, mm -hmm. if, um, like with a piece of artwork, if you haven't registered or, and somebody uses your artwork, you're just out of uh, not entirely. Uh, you can still, if somebody's currently using the artwork, uh, if they're using it online, you can, like as I mentioned before, use the Digital Millennium Copyright Act to get them to try to stop using it online. Um, it's pretty effective when used right, and they're a good guy. I mean, I'm happy to talk to people about it, and there are good guides online for how to use that. Uh, you're still entitled to actual damages for their use of it uh, before you have that registration. Uh, but having that registration increases the amount of damages. I see. Okay. Uh, yeah. Great. And you do need that before you can sue. Uh, but you're not totally out of luck. There are still there are still both formal and informal remedies. I mean, often these things will be resolved by a nasty letter. You can break up those rights however you like. So let's say somebody approaches you about licensing your photo for use in a magazine. You can grant them the exclusive right to use it in a magazine. You can grant a, a non-exclusive right. And uh, you can also break up these rights by geographic region. Basically, as the artist, you have total control to break up these rights any, any way you see fit. So if somebody wants to license your work, you can say, yeah, I'll license you to work for New England, and then reserve the rights to yourself or other states. Uh, 
sale of the artwork is another big issue that artists come up uh, uh, come up with a lot. Um, at its most fundamental level, when you sell a piece of artwork, you're just selling the piece of artwork. You're not selling the copyright as well. Uh, so a great example and very common that you'll see is photographs. The photographer sells a copy of the photograph, but retains the right as the copyright owner to make additional copies of that photograph, as long as, you know, if it's a limited edition, as long as the artist is abiding by however many he's setting out in this limited edition. Uh, that may vary with a commission work, depending on what your agreement is with the person who's commission, commissioning it. In most cases, if it's a normal commission, somebody walks off the street and says, hey, I really love your work, will you make me a piece according to these general specifications? The artist will still generally retain the copyright. Uh, instances where that's not the case is if it's what's called a work for hire under copyright law. Work for hire under copyright law is a company is making, uh, let's say, a book, and they're specifically soliciting work from various artists that will be combined into a greater whole. Uh, that's the kind of textbook example of a work for hire. In those cases, there also will generally be an agreement that states that it is a work for hire and that the corporation paying for the work retains the right. Um, another common example of a work for hire is if you're an employee and if that is within the general scope of your work as an employee. So if you're hired by a company as an illustrator, uh, you're working as an illustrator, you create an illustration for the company, the company will typically own that copyright uh, because that's what they paid you to do. Uh, I've blew through that. Are there more questions that, about copyright? Does that pertain to commission, like a, any commissioned artwork? Um, so the, let me make sure I understand the question. Does the work for hire apply yeah. to any commissioned yeah, artwork? I mean, if you were commissioned to do a, a, a portrait, a bust of somebody, a sculpture, and you make a mold of it mm -hmm. to, to make the cast, right. who owns the mold? Uh, so the question was, if uh, you're commissioned to make a sculpture of a person, who owns the mold from which uh, you're making uh, the sculpture? In most cases, that will be you, the artist, who still owns that, because it's not part of a greater work. Um, the, the, the dividing line there is whether or not it, the work that you're being hired to do is being combined into something greater, uh, that, you know, the corporation or the person, the person's, and this is a far out example, is hiring eight different artists to all make different sculptures of them for a large installation. That may be the outlying case where you don't retain that copyright. Uh, but in most cases you will, because it's still your artistic, all of your artistic effort that's going into that original piece. And it's not being included as part of a greater whole. You're just being commissioned to do one single work. And yes. my understanding with Work for Hire is that you actually have to sign a contract saying that you relinquish your rights as a work, and it's a Work for Hire arrangement. Uh, it has to be in writing. The statement was that you have to sign an agreement. That's not always true. Uh, there are, if you're assigning your copyright to somebody, that does have to be in writing. But a work for hire, uh, in cases where it's a work for hire, it, the argument is that the artist never owned that copyright to begin with. So certainly if, um, if you write a book, for instance, and somebody says, I want to buy that book from you, including the whole copyright, that assignment, that assigning the, that copyright from yourself to the publisher, that has to be in writing. For, in certain cases, a work for a hire, depending on how it's arranged, does not have to be in writing. Um, a, a good example of that is the employment agreement. So if I'm hired by a company and don't have a specific employment agreement, it's still a work for a hire if I'm doing illustrations for that company, even if I don't specifically say it's a work for a hire or that I assign my copyright to them. But what about a freelancer agreement? Uh, free, uh, they're almost always going to have a written agreement with a freelancer to, uh, to make that clear. Um, and if they don't, you should probably ask for a written agreement to clarify, you know, who owns what. Uh, you raised your hand? Yeah, just a, just a quick thing. So if you, if you are working for somebody and you do an illustration or something like that, mm -hmm. and they don't use it, it still belongs to them. Yeah, they, Again, depending on the exact nuances of the situation, yes. If they're hiring you for an illustration to include in the work, uh, you know, if they're hiring you to make a cartoon that they're putting in the New Yorker, uh, and uh, even if they don't use it, they still retain that copyright. 
in most cases, if you go up to them and say, hey, you never used it, I'd love to include it in my portfolio, do you mind? They'd probably say, that's fine. But it's always good to you know, either get that in writing or clarify that. But could you resell it then? Uh, it would depend on the exact details of the agreement. Uh, probably not if it's a work for hire and they own the copyright, unless you specifically get a right back from them to sell it. Uh, again, probably not. Just want to follow up with my first question. Please. Theoretically, I mean, if you, somebody hires you to do a bust of it, mm -hmm. it turns out and you make the cast for them, and you have the mold and you pull another cast, mm -hmm. can you sell that cast? Uh, at that point, if it's a commission, you probably want to have clarified what you could do with that when you started the commission. Um, I know in the few times where I've commissioned to work, it's always been clear that either the artist would make a bunch and I'd pick the one that you know best suited what I liked and they'd have the right to sell the others in that series, or it was a one of a kind that was commissioned specifically for me and that they couldn't use it again. Uh, none of those were cases where it's easily reproducible like a, a casting, um, but in that case you'd probably want to clarify with the, with the customer to make sure that you're both on the same page as to what it is, but, you know, theoretically you'd be in the clear. Well, Go on. If, if the person who commissioned the work took it and made their own molding, can, can they cast it? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, so the question was if Somebody, you make a cast, uh, mo uh, I'm not going to get all this terminology right now, I apologize. Uh, you make a bust for the person, they then make a casting of that, and then try to make co additional copies of that. Uh, that's probably not okay, because the artist would be retaining a copyright in that situation. Yes? So, I'd like to go back to the first thing you said. Please. Which was... Um, My name is Ben Snitkoff, and... <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, it protects the expression of an idea, not the idea itself. Yes. So, so if you're using reference photographs or in the, in uh, in a painting, mm -hmm. in the course of painting something, uh, if you're and some of those reference photographs are quite identifiable in the picture, mm -hmm. is that was there any infringement of the photograph, the photographer's copyright? Uh, it depends who you are. Uh, How much you're making off of it. Yeah, uh, I mean, kind of that's true. I can give you two great examples. Uh, there is Shepard Ferry, who did the uh, o iconic Obama poster, the Hope poster. Uh, his He based that off of a reference photograph that was owned by the AP. Uh, the AP sued him, and he ended up, uh, I believe, settling with the AP for a sub substantial amount of money for using that photo without permission in his own work. Um, there's another artist whose name I'm blanking on, Correa, I think, who is well known as an appropriation artist. He'll take other people's images and modify them pretty minorly and include them in his own work, and he's gotten off uh, without, with, you know, not even a slap on the wrist on several occasions for just reusing other people's art. So it's a very fact-intensive look that the, that the court system will do as to whether or not uh, you're infringing the work. And in most cases, that analysis will be done under something called fair use, where they look at, among other things, uh, the nature of the original copyrighted work, the nature of your work, whether it's commercial work, whether it's art, uh, whether you're commenting on the original work in some way. Uh, they'll look at the effect that your use of it has on the market for the original work. So. Is it somehow hurting the market for either additional copies of the original work itself or, say, the licensing market for allowing people to <coughs> license that original work? Uh, and uh, the court can also consider some additional factors in looking at that. And it's just a balancing act that the court goes through to determine whether your right as an artist to use and be inspired by this work is trumped by the copyright law or the other way around, whether you as an artist are changing that work enough, making it your own, or commenting on the original work in such way that fair use protects what you're doing. Which is a big way of saying it depends. <laughs> <laughs> sort of in the same line, mm -hmm. uh, if you're a collage artist and yes. you use tear up magazines or mm -hmm. it's in your collage and it's maybe recognizable where it came from, is, is that infringing? Uh, so, in that case, 
That's a that's a trickier one. Probably not. But the court, another another factor that the court will look at is how much of the original work did you use. <coughs> so if you're using a small fraction of a picture uh, in your collage, you know probably probably the court doesn't care as much about that because you're including it among a lot of other things in order to make this big bigger work that that says more as a whole than you know whatever that little corner of a of a piece that you used was. But these are all. Uh, Depends. Depends on the exact facts. Uh, another interesting thing that brings up is something called the first sale doctrine, which is uh, this protects something that uh, I'm sure a lot of you have done a lot. Uh, so one of the rights in copyright is the right to distribute uh, copies of a work. So let's say I buy a book uh, from Barnes and Noble and I read through the book and it's great and I give it to a friend. Uh, technically, that seems like it should violate copyright law because I just distributed the book by handing it to somebody else. The first sale doctrine says that as long as it uh, says that if I buy a work above the board, you know, arm's length transaction with whomever is selling it to me, I can resell or gift that work to somebody else without infringing the copyright. And the reason that is is because the artist, uh, in that case, the publishing company or the author, has already been paid for that work once. When I when they when I first bought it, I paid it for it. They were paid from whatever <coughs> royalty they got from the sale of the work, and it's not really fair for them to get a piece of every single sale that happens down the line. Uh, yes. What about for a there 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 was something in the art in first kind of going on the art world where for auctions mm -hmm. and so when you buy a piece and that's the first sale and then the owner of that piece mm -hmm. is reselling it mm -hmm. and there's been this legal battle of should the artist retain royalties from that particular second or third sale from a painting mm -hmm. and can you kind of elaborate on that a little bit? Uh, or do you know anything of, or do you know about that? Uh, I'm, I'm aware that, so the question was, yeah. uh, if you sell a work at auction, uh, so somebody buys a work from an artist, it's resold at auction for 10 times the original sale price, uh, does the artist get a chunk of that? And the answer is typically not, for the same reason that I just talked about with the book. Okay. The artist has already been paid once, uh, unless there's some other agreement, mm -hmm. they typically don't get a second bite at the apple. Uh, even though it seems terribly unfair, uh, that's just the way that the law works right now. Uh, it seems like people are lobbying to not have that house to have it. So it was, uh, uh, that they were, it was okay. just some, I, I think it was like an art net. Okay. And, and one of those art blogs were it was, it was trying to lobby for the fact that, hey, my painting sold for X amount of money. You have it at, uh, you know, at Christie's auction. It's mm -hmm. like, I should, like, should I be able to get a chunk of that money too? So, so I was just wondering if there was an like, initial outcome or, or if it was, or if it was this, this is a legal battle that's going to be continuing. Yeah, I haven't heard anything about an uh, impending change in the law. Uh, Disney's copyrights are about to expire, so chances are there's going to be a revision to the copyright law coming up soon. <laughs> uh, hopefully we could squeeze that in somehow. Yes? I think related to that, I think that I had also heard that in California there was some discussion about huh changing some laws related to auctioning off fine art. That's interesting. Where the, you know, kind of like the estate of a particular fine artist would mm -hmm. receive royalties from a second, third, and fourth sale through an auction house. Yeah, that but would I don't, be... I don't know what the what had happened with that, but okay. I thought that there was some. Yeah, yeah it was like, it was, yeah. Yeah, I haven't heard anything specifically about that as far as changes in the law coming down the pipe. It wasn't at the national level, it was yeah. like at the state level. And I think they would have some difficulty even implementing that at a state level because it contradicts with what federal copyright law says and when there's a conflict between state and federal law, federal law tends to win. Uh, are there, uh, if, uh, yes? So I'm assuming this falls into the it depends <coughs> category that was coming up before. But, it's always the answer. But. Um, <laughs> What if rather than like using something, um, so I paint and sometimes my source material is images from a magazine or something, but what comes out is almost unrecognizable. Like, yeah. I don't think anyone could look at that and say, oh, that came from you know mm -hmm. this picture, even when they're next to each other. So at that point, I mean, that's got to be shifted enough that it's not 
I mean, probably. If okay. they can't figure out where the work came from, they'd have a tough time saying that something. it's an unlicensed derivative work of their original thing. But like, on principle, if you know, if you have a picture that you didn't take up on your wall and right. you're painting that in a way that's changing it dramatically, I mean, where's? <laughs> I guess there's no. So, I guess my thinking is, as a, as an artist, where is the line between sort of respecting the copyright of another artist, mm -hmm. but also allowing yourself the creativity to play with source material. Right. Uh, I totally understand the question, the, which is, where's the line between being inspired by somebody else's art and creating your own? And as far as copyright's concerned, there's no clear, bright line in the sand uh, that you can say, you know, I'm being inspired by this work but not copying it under copyright law, uh, which is frustrating. Uh, but it's the truth. Um, if it's if you're changing it to a point where it's unrecognizable, there's not a lot of risk uh, to you. Uh, the reason Shepard Ferry got caught is because you could uh, put a picture of the AP photo next to his and be like, "Yep, those are identical." Uh, <laughs> when he started making tons of money. Yeah, he. Well, I don't know if he ever. I don't know how much money he made off of that. Obama for America. I don't think he did from that particular piece. Oh, but yeah. Spread. Yes, he made a lot of his, money as a result his, of that fame. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, ooh, there was something he else. He became more of a target, I think, is my point. Uh, yes, that's that's also fair. Um, there's something in, in the legal field that we call uh, defendants being judgment proof, uh, which is that even if uh, even if you do have a great claim against them, there's no money to get. So you could sue them and you could win, but if you're not going to recover any money, there's, there's no point. point. Um, I wouldn't use that as a defense. It's, uh, it's, it's not a great idea, but it, it's a consideration that goes into whether or not you're going to sue somebody. You know, if there's a chance, if there's no chance of recovering that the, the money that you're putting into the lawsuit, a lot of people are going to be like, well, well, why even bother? Um, feel free to continue to ask me questions about copyright. I'm going to transition at least briefly to gallery law in Massachusetts. Yes, yes before we go. Can I just add one more question? If Please. You can elaborate. Um, this other thing that our, I know our organization has been fighting for many years now is the potential open works legislation that's been proposed. Yep. Could you talk a little bit about that? Uh, not well. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so the question was about orphan works legislation. And uh, briefly what orphan works are, are uh, let's say there's a, a book and you would love to license the book to be able to use you know, an excerpt from the book in something you're writing. Uh, you've tried very hard and you cannot find anything uh, linking you to who you should talk to to get rights for the book. Orphan works legislation allows you a way to use that kind of safely, even though you can't find the person from whom you're supposed to license it. Uh, that is about all I know off the top of my head about Orphan Works. I think it's the one thing that our organization has been concerned about as illustrators is that it's very easy for your work to end up online yeah. and your signature may have been stripped off intentionally or unintentionally. Mm -hmm. And then, the, the, since the legislation has been written in such an with ambiguous language, the user is kind of favors the, the yes. searcher rather than the art protecting the artist. And so we've been fighting that so that it doesn't come about because we feel that the uh, language is so ambiguous that the user is supposed to only say that they've done a diligent search and can't find the artist and therefore they're allowed to use the art, whereas um, right. we feel that more protection needs to be the artist. Right. Uh, I, that was a, an eloquent statement of the, the that side of the issue. Uh, I doubt there's going to be any movement on that in the near future. I think it's coming up this spring. Really? Again. This, okay. Yeah. They've asked for, there was a, the copyright office had a... Oh, okay. As far as uh, asking for comment. Okay. Yeah, comment. Sorry. I was thinking actual legislation. No, uh, for, it's being, it's investiga being investigated. Okay. And, Copyright office is taking comments from right. different organizations. Okay, and then they're revising their own rules regarding it. Okay, in that case, yes. Uh, I would encourage people to, I'm sorry, what's your name again? Lori Messenger. Lori, uh, talk to her. Uh, there's an open comment period whenever a federal agency uh, issues new regulations. So what they have to do is anybody who writes them a letter, they have to read the letter and basically respond to it openly and say this is why we agree with or don't agree with your comments about the new rules we're proposing. So the more people who write in, uh, the better it is for artists. Well, the more artists who write in, the better it is for artists. All right, one other copyright question. Yep. 
the use of the copyright symbol. Yeah. Do you need to be registered to use that, or can I just stick that on my website and let it count? Uh, stick it on your website with the year and then your last name. And do you need to update it each year? I mean, it's the year that it's first published. Okay. So if you're doing it on individual photos mm -hmm. on your copy on your website, the, that should be the year that the but photo was first page. published. It's on the bottom of your website. I just update that every year uh, because the website's constantly changing. Uh, so yeah, you do you do not need to register a copyright to use the copyright symbol, and that's the C with the little circle around it. Uh, use that the year whatever the work was first published, and then uh, put your name on it. And uh, as far as why you'd want to do that. It, uh, if you properly mark your art, it goes to show that whoever was copying it was willfully copying it, that they knew or should have known that it was a copyrighted work, and that can increase the damages that uh, they owe you in the event of a copyright infringement lawsuit. Um, yes? Um, a little bit different, but still on copyright, you know anything about typefaces and fonts? Uh, yeah, I mean, as far as... Could you be a little more specific with what your question is? Well, let's say you're, you're creating a Christmas card yep. and you're saying Merry Christmas mm -hmm. and you're using Adobe Garamond typeface. Yes. Is, is that legal? Uh, yes. That's so, okay. Garamond if you... is. <laughs> well, let's say a, a copyrighted font you're using on in your artwork. Yeah, uh, if, as long as you have legally purchased a copy of well, whatever the Adobe program is, what let's assume didn't... that. Let's uh, <laughs> We'll move on in a second. Let's assume that somehow you legally, at some point in your life, purchased a, a copy of an Adobe program that came with that font. Those fonts, uh, in the case of Adobe, are licensed for commercial use. They're licensed for personal use. By legally purchasing a copy of their software, you can use the fonts that come with it. Uh, there are font foundries, uh, typeface foundries, I should say, who create you know, special typefaces for corporations to buy and use. If you come across one of those, uh, you know, the best practice is to buy a license to use that typeface. And then, you know, uh, check to see what the licenses allow. Uh, I recently bought one uh, for my company. Uh, I made sure that I could use it in print and on the web. Uh, it's just boxes that I checked when I was, you know, checking out after purchasing it. Uh, that gave me a license to use it commercially for those purposes. Um, typefaces are copywritten. I don't think it's a particularly lively enforcement area outside of extreme cases. But the safe answer is if it came with whatever piece of software you legally purchased, you're allowed to use it. Uh, if you went out and bought it specifically, uh, for that purpose, you're allowed to, you know, use that under the license. Um, yeah. There's also sites where people upload open source typeface mm -hmm. that, like, just people who like designing typeface create, and they're up there for for use to do whatever you will with them. Yes. So if you have a Facebook artist page and you post pictures of your work, does the copyright date and last name still work if you? Put that in a comment of your post, or mm -hmm. do you have to actually put it on the picture? I'm sorry. Uh, it's just Facebook's an interesting piece because I think they have weird rules about what. I can talk a little bit. Uh, yeah, if you could. That'd be great. The question. Oh, I'll I'll repeat the question. So the question was, if you're uploading a picture to copyright, is it all right to uh, either in the subtitle of the photo or in the comment? Put the copyright symbol, the year it was first published, and your last name. You're talking think, about Facebook, like your artist page on Facebook. Yeah, I think that would be fine. Uh, you can also embed copyright information into the image itself uh, using a lot of freely available software. That's a great way to go about it because there are additional punishments if somebody strips out that copyright information that's digitally embedded into the image. As far as I'll get to you just one second. Uh, as far as copy uh, Facebook itself. Uh, Facebook gets a license to uh, copy and redistribute and republish your work because that's what Facebook is there for. Uh, it's a bunch of servers that make copies of your image and then show it to your friends and fans and people who like your and visit your page. So they do get a license to use your work, a pretty broad license to use it, but you still retain the copyright as the artist. Okay, so you said that you should put the year that you were first copyrighted it. First published it. First yes. published it. 
And if you're if you have a if you want to have one copyright statement on your web page, and you have uh, works that are old and new and everything in between, and some of them have been on previous websites, mm -hmm. then how do you go about? You have to do each individual one. Yeah. I there's no right answer for that. Uh, if you're putting the copyright at the bottom of your web page, I would keep that year up to date. Okay. Um, but I, it's tough to it's tough to get a clean clean way to do that as far as design goes. In that case, embedding the copyright information in the picture uh, would probably be the easiest way to make sure that all the images have the date of first publication and the website. Yeah. Some of these things, the law doesn't quite line up with what is easy or practical yeah. for artists to do, uh, but that's the way the law works sometimes. Uh, gallery law, um, and again, uh, we can go back to copyright at the end, but there's some very important stuff in this section that I want to make sure we uh, touch on. Massachusetts has some great laws that protect artists uh, putting work in galleries. And uh, the sheet of paper that says Modern Renaissance Legal at the top, that's my kind of one sheet for artists uh, exhibiting work in galleries in Massachusetts. Uh, among other things, in Massachusetts, you're entitled to prompt payment within 90 days of the sale. If they don't pay you within 90 days, you get 5% interest running from when they should have paid you. Uh, if it's 180 days, you're entitled to three times what they should have paid you and 5% interest running from when they should have paid you on that full amount, uh, on that full three times amount, uh, which is great. Uh, you're also entitled as the artist upon payment to get information about who purchased your work. And there are not a lot of galleries, I think, in Massachusetts that comply with this law. But you're entitled to contact information for the person who purchased your work. If you're not getting that, you should ask them for it. Uh, and if they're hesitant, uh, refer them to the statute that I have in that sheet of paper that says, listen, by law you have to provide this to me. Um, it's great for artists because, let's say down the line, you, you know, you never got a picture of that piece of work and you'd really like to have that picture for your portfolio or somebody's contacting you about exhibiting it. Having that name of who purchased it is pretty vital for you trying to get a photograph of that or recover the work later on. Uh, you can also request that contact information. Uh, all of the records regarding, all of the gallery's records regarding when the work came in, uh, how much they sold it for, those are available to you for inspection on reasonable notice. Um, the dealer is responsible for loss or damage to the work while it's in their possession, unless you don't pick it up for a really long period of time, uh, in which case you, know, you should have picked it up when, when you were done exhibiting there. Uh, and another exception to that is if they can't find you. It's your job as the artist to make sure that your contact information is up to date. Um, they have to get you your money, so you have to make sure that they know how to get you your money. Uh, keeping your contact information up to date with either your phone number, address, preferably both, maybe even an email address in there, is a good way to make sure that the <laughs> gallery can't weasel its way out of anything uh, with regard to what they owe you. Yes? Um, there are a lot of galleries that will, you know, not big galleries, or but a lot of places, let's put it this way, that show your work that will say, uh, we're not liable if anything happens. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me what you're saying is different from that. Am yeah, I the statute says that they are liable if anything happens to the work in their possession. <laughs> Sorry? The catch I would say is, in my experience, when that's the case, you're signing something that says, I will not hold you liable. Yeah, so, so if you... That's, that's, if that's them saying, we're asking you to sign this so that if something happens, you can't turn around and sue us for being liable. Mm -hmm. Which I think if you sign something, then there's nothing you can do about it. I'd want to double... Yeah, I'd want to double check the statute before I give you a firm answer one way or the other. There are certain provisions of the law that cannot be waived, even by a signed contract. <coughs> I'm not sure if damage is one of them. Because that's pretty regular, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it is. Like, but it is. That's why I'm asking. SOS does that when they yeah, right. when The show statute stuff. you're talking about yes. applies only to galleries? I think they're talking about Yeah, I guess that would be then what's yeah. the difference so, between a gallery and any other like, a space like this. Right. Uh, it applies to any place where you are selling, art, selling or exhibiting art on commission. Okay. So there's the catch. Why? How is that? 
So like if you, I'll take Christopher's for example, mm -hmm. right? If you have work hanging in Christopher's in Porter Square, if someone wants to buy that work, they're not paying Christopher's and Christopher's is taking a commission and then paying you. Yeah. You have a business card and they contact you and they're, yeah, so it's, there's probably a legal argument to be made that, that in that case is not a gallery space. Uh, I mean, I'd have to take a closer look at it. It includes exhibiting work. The statute includes a place where you are exhibiting work. Uh, so in that case, it may still apply. I'm not, without having a better concept of uh, what exactly they do or how they arrange anything, I, I can't tell you for sure whether or not they fall under that statute. And I'm yes. wondering about consignment yep. versus commission mm -hmm. and retail versus gallery. Okay. Um, like what, where, what are the distinctions and is it, are they important? Uh, so any instance where you give them the work, they hold on to it, and then you get a chunk of whatever the sale is, would fall under the statute. So consignment would fall under the yes, statute. Yes, I would. I would think it would. Um, and then there was another thing that you asked: consignment as opposed to commission. Uh, and retail versus gallery. Like when it's a retail space, yes. store versus gallery. Like is that an important? Distinction? That is not the important distinction. So the question was whether it matters if it's a retail store that's also exhibiting work or a gallery that is dedicated to exhibiting work. Mm -hmm. As long as you're exhibiting your work there or and selling it on the basis of a fee or commission uh, and there's one other thing in the statute that I don't have memorized uh, as long as one of those is checked off a uh, fee consignment or you know a, a commission it, it still counts as a, a dealer under the statute because I've seen those liability forms regularly yeah I'm just thinking, I mean like I, I could be wrong, but if memory serves me, when you put stuff in the Somerville Museum for the SOS oh, yeah, show, you sign do. something that says right. that they're not yeah. liable in case yeah. of there, damages. There are plenty of places, though, a little, you know, like businesses who want a commission, want to t want to take of what you sell, and they don't, the same kind of thing, you know, yeah. they don't, it's like they say, they don't have insurance or they don't have, they're not going to, you know, um, pay you. I'm not, I mean, not pay, they're, you know. They're yeah, they don't want to be liable for not any damage to the work. Like I said, I... So that's part of what I'm trying to think. Right. Part of this, at least part of the statute, is not subject to waiver, even if you sign something that says, I waive my rights under the statute. Uh, it, the statute itself says you can't waive it. I have to double check as to whether or not the damages provision is is included in, uh, therein. Um, Would there be a way for us to kind of hear back from you about yeah, right. uh, uh, If you all can wait once I wrap up for oh. 10 minutes or so, I can sure. probably check on my phone and get back cool. to you. Uh, I just think it'd be, uh, I wouldn't want to just do it right <laughs> Yeah, that'd be uh, great. Uh, some uh, other important news. Uh, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Hampshire have similar laws to Massachusetts. They're not as robust, but they do protect uh, artists who exhibit work in galleries or in retail spaces that uh, um, uh, to sell on commission. Uh, notably, uh, Maine and Vermont do not have laws uh, like this. Uh, one of the big things that the Massachusetts uh, and Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Hampshire laws do is they say that if the work is on the wall in a place, it's generally considered trust property. Uh, and that's important because let's say uh, the, uh, the gallery in which you're exhibiting uh, owes money to somebody. Typically, uh, somebody to whom they owe money could come in and say, listen, you owe us a lot of money. We're going to get a lien on all of the stuff in your property. And that would include art on the wall unless you're in one of those states. So in Vermont and Maine, unless you register your work uh, with the state government under what's something that's called the uh, Uniform Commercial Code, it's a form you fill out, you can do it online, and I think both Maine and Vermont, basically saying, these are the pieces of work that I have, that I own as the artist. They're exhibited in this particular gallery. You want to get that on file once you deliver the work to, those, to that gallery. What's that? Uniform, form? Form? Uniform Commercial Code, UCC. Yeah. Uh, if you Google whatever state you're exhibiting in and UCC Form 1, uh, that will have the information as to how you go about it. In a lot of states, it's a pretty nominal fee. It's something like $10 uh, to fill out the form online and say, this is the art. I, it's my art. It's on 
display in the gallery, and somebody who comes in later can't just can't take a lean out on that artwork to satisfy the debts of the gallery. Uh, but that's a hugely important issue that uh, I don't think gets covered a lot. Um, that's uh, pretty much all I have. I'm happy to continue to field a few questions, and then we'll probably break. In a bit. Nothing else? Yes. I was uh, wondering uh, about how. Well, I'm a, I'm a playwright, and I know when a lot of playwrights having conversations amongst ourselves, and there's a lot of. Uh, we don't always seem to, uh, they're not always knowledgeable about, uh, about the protections of the laws of the uh, Part of our situation is, generally speaking, we retain copyright mm -hmm. on our work. We're not doing work for hire like a television or a film writer. Um, but, but our works are always interpreted by another and we license them out as an Right. To be interpreted basically. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how what what rights we have in dealing with those interpreters, i.e. a theater company, for instance. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a it's a really interesting issue. Um, the question was what rights do playwrights have as far as the integrity, I think, yeah. uh, of the work goes as it's being interpreted through the director and the theater company that's putting up the work. Um, this isn't the area in which I'm strongest, but my general understanding is if it's written down, unless they get permission from you, that's the way it has to be. So if there are stage directions, the stage directions have to be honored. If a certain character in the script is listed in the character description as a male mid-40s to 50s, that character should be portrayed as such. Uh, as long as the work is, you know, uh, owned by an artist, you know, a lot of the times, the reason I'm phrasing it that way, is if a work is in the public domain, like Shakespeare, you can do whatever the heck you want with it. Um, because Shakespeare no longer owns the copyright on any of his plays. Uh, <laughs> despite what Disney would, would want us to, to believe. Uh, as far as the playwright goes, uh, you know, you're not allowed to make edits to the play willy-nilly. Um, you know, if it's written down, it should be in the production, with some margin of error for, you know, an artist forgetting their lines. It should not be intentionally cut. Yes? So I do poems associated with my paintings, mm -hmm. and um, they're not physically attached to the painting. Okay. Um, so how do they follow, the, how does that, how does this sort of stuff um, work with something that's a written piece and a, and a painting? That's an interesting question, I'm one I hadn't really considered before. Yeah? <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, the question is, uh, she does paintings associated with her, sorry, poems associated with her paintings. How does the copyright deal with a, how does the copyright law deal with that? Uh, it's a little tricky, I would think, uh, because when you go to register a work, you typically register either a text work or a work of visual arts, and there's, you could, you could register the painting and then also along with it the poem as, you know, combined a work of visual arts. Um, I don't think there's any big downside to that. Uh, it, it, I'm getting the feeling that I'm not quite answering your question. Well, you know, sometimes they are separable. Yes, they are. And, um, and they, I don't put the, I don't put the poem right on the painting itself. It's, mm -hmm. it's a separate thing. Okay. And I'm just wondering, are there things that cover that? And, um, and using one without the other. And I actually have an example of that okay. a little bit. And, and my, uh, like for Beatrix Potter, her, her stories are in the public domain, mm -hmm. but her illustrations are not. So it, it's, uh, I think both, I, I, um, I think they're both there, they're registered separately. Uh, I, as far they as, can be. So I, I think that it might be something I, I, I mean, would it be a, like a separate kind of You thing? could register them separately. Um, I don't know if there's a big advantage to that, especially if the point is that they're to be viewed together, even if they can be viewed separately. Uh, if you're looking to register the work, uh, like I said, I think you could do a single registration for both the visual work, the painting, and the poem. Uh, as far as copyright law goes, if you're copying the whole poem, you're still copying a whole poem, and I think 
a, a judge would say you're still copying the whole poem even if it's associated with this painting, mm -hmm. similar with the painting. Um, it, it judges, the law being what it is, judges tend to have a good head about them for uh, looking at something and going, that's not an excuse. You saying that you only copied the entire poem uh, when it was registered as a poem and a painting, uh, that, that it just doesn't pass the smell test is another thing we say as lawyers, that if it smells, if it smells funny, it is funny. Um, any other questions? Uh, in that case, I would like to thank you all very much for coming. Thank the Armory for hosting us. And if you stick around, I will get an answer to that question about waving liability. Thank you. Uh, oh.